Welcome to Renegade Inc. If you listen to Western leaders or the corporate media, you'd believe that Russia is by far the most evil and regressive country on the planet, and therefore needs to be sanctioned back to the Stone Age as its punishment. But how much of this rhetoric is based on fact, rather than the fear of the Russian bear coming out of hibernation into our interdependent multipolar world? Professor Vladimir Goldstein, really good to have you on Renegade Inc. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Professor, um, tell me, uh, whenever we hear about people talking about the East uh, and the West, as it were, uh, Russia, China, you know, um, the so-called developed West, we always hear a comparison between uh, Western economies uh, and the Russian economy. Let's just take that as an example. And the comparison is always, oh, well, I mean, the economy of Texas is bigger than Russia. And Russia, in fact, the economy is not as big as Italy even. It's not even in the top 10. Why um, are people so quick to jump on this statistic, to talk about Russia in this way? And is it old world thinking or is it true that the Russian economy really isn't that strong? Well, it's definitely old world thinking, and we should remember, you know, that Russia has a tremendous potential. It's sort of tremendous landmass. It has more resources than practically any other country in the world. And Russia also has a tendency to mobilize. We know from history, you know, when there is a need, Peter the Great turned the country around. Uh, you know, uh, Stalin turned the country around, you know, Soviet Union turned the country into, uh, you know, superpower when there is neither right. So in other words, potential is there. You know, do the Russians always live to their potential? Probably not. But, uh, you know, they, we know that they can get things around. So right, uh, Soviet Union you know, uh, under Stalin turned into, you know, basically superpower. They managed to prepare to, to the war, producing as many tanks, as many other sort of, you know, things, gadgets which required metal, thinking, whatever, very, very, very rapidly. What was stressing is precisely that in terms of human talent, in, in terms of resources, it's all there. Uh, so to think or dismiss Russia by some certain kind of statistics, it's very, very naive. We have to remember that Soviet Union in Russia emerged from the Soviet Union. The situation there was like pretty unclear way of planning, documenting, measuring things. So what, what the United States can measure in terms of production, we know that in Russia, for example, half of that is done what they call through black market. I know like, you know, when I go to Russia, I hear the people who sort of, you know, who would on the paper, they would sort of charge for, for building a house 10,000 rubles. Uh, in reality, it's 10, uh, 10 million. Uh, so if somebody looks at the paperwork and says, oh, they produced a, a, a merchandise worth of 10,000, while in fact there is much more. So th this is very important, important, important data. So I know a lot of economists actually suggest a different way of measuring things and, you know, they'll be much more productive. And at that level, Russia will be like very, very sort of, you know, advanced. But is that the case? Is that that old world thinking that um, people are using a snapshot sort of balance sheet approach, if you like, into whatever it might be, uh, uh, whatever the metrics, whatever the stats. And actually, it is uh, undervaluing a country that has come an enormously long way over the last two and a half decades. Um, and the hubris uh, used to value uh, in this way uh, actually is um, creates a complacency in the West, um, whereas the Russian bear is actually moving quicker uh, uh, and more efficiently than uh, we give it credit for. That's absolutely true. And I, you know, I go to Russia and I observe many things. And you can imagine, for example, uh, the famous situation with sort of post-Ukraine sanctions when they introduced. And, and Russia said, we're not go going to buy products from EU. And like literally within two years, they began to produce very good, <laughs> good stuff domestically. You go to restaurants, now they have all this fancy food produced domestically. They, 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 they create things, they build things. So uh, Russians are very quick study. There's always like tradition 
uh, that you know like when when uh again going back to peter the great he brings people to the west say okay i want this to build a ship i want to do this you know build this and, and they build them very quickly and then they and then they sort of so i i, I think now with this possibility of, of of going back and forth uh when when the soviet union collapsed there was like few years and unfortunately that was the time when a lot of western observers would go to russia and they would see a collapse they would they see inefficiency they would see corruption they would see crime and they projected okay that's 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 the way it is it's totally not the way it is now you know have sanctions created and the made in russia uh, uh a tagline on a lot of the products um, now coming from that area of the world, uh, has the sanctions built an internal capacity which has actually been an own goal for uh, the EU uh, and the Americans? I, you know, they definitely, sanctions didn't achieve what they wanted to achieve. And in fact, I think sanctions are very good for Russia. It basically puts a pressure on Russia. There's always Russians, always talk about it, that until there is a trouble, the Russian president wouldn't move until there is external pressure. So now I think, A, first of all, the country appears much more cohesive. There is much more friendliness now. Before that, there was like still sort of after collapse, there was this and this. Now they feel a, a, a external pressure and people are more friendly, more open to each other, more willing to co cooperate, more interested. And, you know, and, 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 and they inventing things, doing things. You can go through a lot of cities, there'll be like, not necessarily even Moscow and Petersburg, there'll be new young people opening bars, opening cafes, opening little businesses. So I think the, the more sanctions there are, they're better. Maybe for some poor countries, say, if you take Cuba, uh, or whatever, which cannot produce something, and they put the sanctions in terms of the oil, and then, then it might be an issue. But Russia doesn't need anything. They actually have everything they want, and, and then some. So, so the only thing I suspect they need, but they, they, they get it, either probably certain Western know-how and definitely some capitals for investment. And there is one, another additional problem that a lot of wealthy Russians probably invest money somewhere else. But eventually they will find, find, find the way around that too. Coming to uh, the idea of collapse, when the Soviet Union uh, did fall over, uh, capitalism reigned supreme, uh, well, so we were told uh, a lot of the uh, excesses were justified, uh, a lot of markets uh, went bananas, uh, and we also know that one of the side effects of that is massive inequality and also environmental degradation. This um, apparent uh, reigning supreme of capitalism, do you see the neoliberal West now uh, crumbling in a way that uh, hasn't delivered on a lot of the promises that were given um, at that juncture when the Soviet Union fell and apparently capitalism was, uh, you know, the poster boy for liberation? Well, the Russians have to learn and they sort of are capable of learning. And what, what they have to learn is that A, West is not panacea. And they also have to look east and learn certain things from China, because for a while, uh, you know, during the Soviet time, there was like silly tradition in, in Russia that, you know, Russia is an older brother and China is a younger brother. And we don't have much to learn from them. We are, in fact, in advance. Now, Russians, you know, a lot of Russians finally begin to trade with China. They go to China, they learn from China, and they learn that there are certain things that just rampant neoliberal capitalism is not the solution, precisely because they see on the world stage how China is actually gaining against the West. So they will learn and they and they already have a potential for for like certain social structures, social methods, social thinking. So it just, you know, they need an extra push and they'll be able to combine, I would say, the best of the East and the best of the West. So they just, but following the West, when, which it just shows is bankruptcy on practically on every turn, it's a really kind of naive uh, approach, and luckily Russians have seen have seen it that it doesn't work. So I think this kind of uh, infatuation with the West is definitely gone. I mean, sanctions function on, if you wish, on a literal, physical level, but also on a metaphorical ones. So that is, you know, Russians are trying to to trade with. The, Everyone, you know, I, I remember I was in Petersburg and they, they would sell some kind of, you know, 
pitches and I look where they're coming from and some of them are coming from Middle East, some of them are coming from Latin America, some of them are coming from South Africa. So they're trading, they are open, they're interested in trading and they have plenty to offer of course, gas and whatever. But also on on a you know more kind of intellectual level they realize that the West is actually is not necessarily a friend, that the West treats us like condescendingly and thinks that they can just squeeze us and whatever and the Russians have their own kind of definitely pride or whatever so they will learn and they will learn and, and they uh, things that uh, understand that many things can be done differently what what a little bit tro troublesome and i think I, uh, one hopes that russia will get out of it is that a lot of russian elite they still got the education say they, they, they dream to send their child to oxford cambridge or harvard and there they get a little bit brainwashed in terms of uh, uh, Western ways are good ways and their only ways. So there is certain tension. But I think eventually they they would learn, and we know that you know China has a lot to offer. Uh, Iran has uh, plenty of things to offer. So I think the West used to be the only play in town, and that's why sanctions could have worked. But not anymore. Not anymore. And this is something which the West, you know, can still come to terms with. A bigger play in town is climate breakdown. Uh, now, uh, this idea, which goes back to the collapse of the Soviet Union, which is, you know, uh, one side's good, the other side's bad, black, red, however you want to um, divide it. Haven't the West, uh, uh, the Russians and the Chinese, is there a moment where they have to come and sit at the table and understand that the only way to beat this uh, is collaboration. That's about time. And I remember a long time ago, Russians like Gorbachev, whatever, they were talking about spaceship Earth, that we're in all that together. We have to sort of think about it. But, you know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, somehow there was this, you know, a West continue to think that they can go it alone. And that's sort of, you know, every time you get a reminder, now the flooding in Germany. Now is this. Now that you cannot go it alone. <laughs> there is a giant amount of population living outside the West. There is giant masses of land, which you know, with the climate and everything. And if you know half of the world pollutes, then you know, as much as you can do things in Belgium, you still get flooded. So I think it's time to sit at the table. It's it's time to uh, kind of forget it. But you know, we need what is important. We need new types of leaders. People maybe the young younger generation or something. But, you know, if you look at it, the United States continued well already way into 20, you know, 21st century. They continue to be run by these baby boomers, people who formed the Second World War with this kind of particular mentality. And I think the system is very well entrenched. They try to, to, to preserve it. So I think, you know, changes, you know, we know that that's how uh, the nature and the world teaches us, you know, by, by sending all this kind of cataclysm. So eventually we'll learn, but, but I think it will take a different type of the leader. So the world waits. Andre Nakrasa, really wonderful to have you on Renegade Inc. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. History, as we know, is written by the victors. After 1991, when the uh, Soviet Union fell and the war came down, uh, really in the West, we've only had one uh, version of events. Uh, you're a filmmaker, somebody who looks at narrative a lot, looks at people, uh, thinks about story. What's the other narrative from Russia uh, from 91 to the present day? Well, for the majority of Russians, the 90s was at, at, at best complicated uh, and challenging. Uh, but uh, uh, tragic also for, for a lot of people. And uh, um, the, the word democracy was just a, a, a slogan in, in name. You know, it has nothing to do with power of the people. It was an ideological beacon for some. But uh, in fact, uh, uh, President Yeltsin at the time uh, was not even elected uh, as a, pr a president of this new capitalist Russia he was elected as a president of Soviet Union Republic. And then in 96, he had a popularity rating of 6%, according to some sources, 2%, and then miraculously won an election. So th that couldn't be democratic. Even liberals admit there was manipulation and it wasn't a fair, free and fair election. So um, democracy was some kind of capitalist ideology. 
you know, all to do with, uh, and not even capitalist, but a sort of rubber baron capitalist, the completely unfair and sometimes financially criminal privatization. That, that is the real narrative. The uh, 91 revolution, as far as I'm concerned, was a failure. You know, it was technically a failure. So then it, it, one shouldn't be surprised that there would be a re reaction, a, a, a counter-revolution in respect of that 91 uh, Russian anti-communist revolution. It's not the first time that uh, democracy, the word democracy, has been used to so-called liberate uh, new markets, as they, let's put it that way. Shock therapy uh, is what happened um, in the 90s, and yeah. a lot of Western so-called investors got very, very rich uh, yeah. exploiting natural resources uh, and labour and other yeah. things in Russia. Yeltsin really let that happen, didn't he? Well, he, some people say that he personally wasn't even very corrupt. He was, you know, he, he liked a, a drink or two, but he certainly, his entourage certainly was. And uh, he, was, he was a failure. You know, people now say whatever they want, that he saved uh, Russia and even, even the West from communism because he came to Washington sort of declared mea culpa, we, we the Russians are to blame for all the wars, all the, uh, all the bad things that, that happened in the uh, 19th, 20th century uh, to the American Congress. Remember with the um, Vietnam War, et cetera, fresh in, in their memories. But um, certainly uh, he was a failure as far as I'm concerned. And so uh, the, the reaction followed. His entourage, uh, did they have a neoliberal mindset? Did they embrace shock therapy and think that actually what you could do almost overnight is uh, jam in all this so-called progress and things would be, you know, uh, the land of milk and honey? Well, absolutely. You know, when, when Margaret Thatcher said there's no alternative, in, in Russia it was a, a, no alternative multiplied by you know, 100. There was absolute, the, the people were told by the government, by the Yeltsin's entourage, and by the West, by the way, by the neoliberal uh, gurus, there is no alternative. This is what you get, or, or, or the gulag. That was the slogan which was, of course, a lie because they, they were all, there were all kinds of ways to, to restructure and reform uh, the Soviet uh, economy. Enter Mr. Vladimir Putin, uh, seen as a successor to Boris Yeltsin. Yeltsin famously said to him, save Russia, or look after Russia, Vladimir. Yeah. Um, and he spotted the oligarch class. He also spotted the Western rent seekers. Uh, and he also thought about Mother Russia. Put all that together and tell us then what happened. Putin had a, a host of, of problems to deal with. He had a, um, a defeat uh, in, in Chechnya, had a, 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 just a few oligarchs controlling the whole country, not just the economy, but the whole country, uh, culture, politics. And he, he started to, to, to solve these problems one by one. And by the way, I was uh, an early critic of, of Vladimir Putin when, whilst the Western leaders like Tony Blair and George W. Bush uh, were, were at first supporting him. I can now see that, that uh, Putin was an absolutely logical, historical reaction of the Russian people, uh, not just him, Putin personally, but uh, what happened in the 90s was not going to be left without, without a kind of history's response. As a, as a Russian, I can tell you, the, the Russian people were, uh, were, were going to, to react, were going to try and take control of their country. Putin's main problem was, of course, that, that Russia by then was ultra-capitalist. He had a... Um, you know, seven, uh, seven or so oligarchs who not only um, had all the power in Russia, but, but were gradually, um, you know, s s selling, selling those, the, those assets or, or merging in, in all kinds of operations uh, to, to, to the West. So uh, Putin had to deal with this. And uh, the ways he dealt with this may have shocked some, but he did change. He, he did change uh, the, uh, the tide. Uh, Putin is, is called in the West as, as an enemy of the Russian people by, by some, you know, which is uh, the, 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 the narrative which is completely false. Putin himself and the support he had from the Russian people were a reaction 
to the neoliberal 90s. So um, both economically, he was, he was trying to change in, inside Russia, he was trying to change uh, whatever he could change, whatever he could save from the Soviet Union, but also, maybe most importantly, geopolitically, he would have none of, of, uh, of Yeltsin's sort of compliance uh, with uh, the, the, the Western domination. Professor Vladimir Goldstein, welcome back to Renegade Inc. In that first half, you talked about uh, thematically leadership, and you specifically said the baby boomers are still an entrenched uh, mentality. It harks, in a sense, back to the Nixon era. Uh, and they're still throwing out the stuff that, you know, that they have forever. Socialism, bad. Russia, bad. Uh, capitalism, the only way forward. Leaders of the free world. Uh, the list goes on. Why do you think uh, the West got stuck in such a leadership rut, uh, a leadership rut so deep that it delivered um, a, let's face it now, a very forgetful uh, President Joe Biden uh, and hasn't been able to move away from that old world mentality, that old thinking? Why did it get stuck in such a rut if economically and politically it's uh, supposed to be so dynamic? Well, you know, there is a good American saying, unfortunately, which sounds like if it ain't broken, don't fix it. So, for, for, so from the perspective of, you know, wealthy establishment classes, it's not broken. They uh, okay. pat themselves on the back saying, we won the Cold War. Our main enemy, again, thinking about Cold War, Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, the socialism cannot do anything. We are doing so well. The whole world kind of listens to us. And I think people persist that that's what they're thinking. And again, if you live sort of comfortably in a particular, particular way of life, it's very hard to change. You know, you don't want to change, you know. So it's, again, going back even to sort of philosophy, there is a very famous Hegel kind of uh, discussion of master-slave dialectics, where he says that slave who has to fight and liberate itself learns to be, think quickly and acquires skills and eventually might become a master. Well, master is just too lazy <laughs> to change his way <laughs> and, and continue sort of to sort of you know to more or less rot. So this is like they are stuck in the old ways. Um, let's come to solutions, uh, Vladimir. Insofar as if we agree and people watching this agree that we don't have the luxury anymore of this massive standoff and you know the the to and fro of it all, the empty words from presidents. If we agree that we need collaboration. Where do we start with solutions? Because it seems to me, and I do say it's a luxury, this luxury of this standoff, uh, only a few people, a handful, the elites that you've talked about benefit from it, as well as, of course, the military industrial complex. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But you know, that people, there should be a pressure, a very strong pressure on politicians willing sort of to get engaged. And I think dogmatism should be thrown away. Honestly, I, you know, I lived, in the Soviet Union under, you know, socialism. And I have my serious doubts about, you know, at least Soviet time. I've seen the United States capitalism. I have my doubts about that. So I, you know, it, what's important to approach is with open mind. And I know certain things works, you know, like when China build a new city and try to build eight lines of roads around it and thinking, you know, in terms of 50 years, that's important. We have to learn from that. But we also have to learn, indeed, how to take care of a forgotten individual, for a forgotten person, and not to think just in number. So I think, you know, each society has plenty to, to offer as long as we a don't try to shove it others down the throat and also have like sane people to cooperate and say we might have limited resources we might probably should do something with overpopulation we should think about something so so not, not at, the, at the expense of one country and another but I think there is enough of goodwill precisely if humanity is not stupid we, we, we might be on the on the brink of <laughs> extinction so I think uh, there'll be a desire desire to do certain things, as long as there is, again, trust established, and we know that we're dealing with a serious, responsible person, not liars, not crooks. You know, if there is no trust on that level, then there is no trust. But I think that eventually there will be trust, and there will be trust in people who would say, we want to learn from each other, and we want to work together. You're a pragmatist, and also steeped in um, 
cultural studies, you've uh, read the great authors, you, uh, are, from uh, an IT point of view, you um, have understood you know, where we're headed with tech. How does the next five, 10 years look from where you're stood? Give us the historical context and where we may get to or where we could get to over that period. I think tech made a lot of you know good good things. You know we we do live in a global wo world now. The, the idea of global village is absolutely obvious. Like even say ten years ago, maybe we would be able to sort of I, I wouldn't be able to sit in my home and talk to you. Uh, you know he you know I had to drive to some studio and there would be some kind of use of sort of fancy satellite. Now it's all possible. So we actually we are connected. We know what's happening in Yemen. We know what's happened in you know in Germany. We know what, what so that, that that's a big uh, so big kind of you know help and I think it would enable people that type of tech actually to keep fingers on the pulse and you know would prevent uh, once we have this sort of you know communication now it's much more difficult for 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 politician to lie about what's happening in Cuba when we have say pictures of, of a different demonstration or something so tech can, can help of, and because of that of course the government try to control it tries to sort of <laughs> limit access try to introduce again old fashioned censorship which is kind of you know wrong headed approach furthermore some tech companies actually I, I get engaged in that. You know, this is really pathetic. They, when when Twitter tries to ban certain politicians from from tweeting, this is just really <laughs> worse than Soviet Union excesses. You know, we need information. We need to know, and people are smart enough to figure think, things out. Uh, and you know, there is, as I said, the goodwill. So I think tech will help us. And I, I honestly believe that there is something in nature which sort of it simultaneously creates problems and creates solutions. It cannot be like just just only a problem. It can, cannot be just we only pollute, we only sort of uh, uh, destroy without us coming up with the other way of say dealing with pollution or dealing with certain things. So I think as long as we unleash this kind of positive forces, not just the only negative forces in terms of pollution, lying, destruction, but, but positive forces which can put, put them to good, good use. Professor Vladimir Goldstein, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.